Well, good morning and welcome at our camp. Um, as you can see, everyone is, is starting up and, and getting ready for a new day. And is that what are we waiting for? Shower. Uh, this is one of our many camps. Taking our tent down. We're going to a different location. Yeah, so everyone has a different start, but we all do it together. So during the day we have three meals. In the evenings we sit here at the campfire. Sometimes we have class, sometimes we have a beer, and then we j just enjoy our time. So this is our truck um, that brings us from place to place on a journey through Kenya and Tanzania. Let's take a look inside. So yeah, welcome in our truck. Okay, close the door, let's go, let's move. The, stu the students here from LUC to East Africa, Kenya, and Tanzania to explore uh, sustainable livelihoods. This region, like many other regions uh, on the continent, is it's one of the one of the harsher regions. It's very dry. There, are, the, the climate change is affecting the ways that people make a living. Um, so it's a it's a fascinating place for for our students um, to begin to research and to understand how how people are adjusting to these massive changes. We started the course um, in Nairobi, which is in one of the fastest growing cities in the, in, on the continent. Cities can be sleepy in character and feeling, but very much even passing through, you could tell there was a lot going on in Nairobi. So one of the first things we saw was um, the Beast Factory, which is called Kazuri. My name is Joseph, and Joseph is going to guide you around the factory. It was a social project. Um, started by a British woman. And they tried to empower single moms, so that was very interesting to see. Though being a uh, activity to empower single mothers, I thought it was very interesting that there was still a very gendered role of um, labor. Men were doing all of, all of the pottery and the women were really making the beads. I think it would take more time and more engagement to actually really know and learn about the experiences of the people working there because we only got the perspective from the director and it was not necessarily that we're interrupting their work they were all very friendly and happy to talk with us. I, mean, I talked to the women and um, they were really enjoying what they were doing they were very proud and it was very interesting to see that these women were given this opportunity in Nairobi where there's such a high population pressure and such a high demand for jobs. Uh, next, our teacher surprised us with a visit to Dave Sheldrock's uh, elephant orphanage. We were at a daily showing of the elephants where a lot of tourists flood in and the elephants are displayed and their story is told. It is because of the porch where their mothers were killed and this is because of the trail on ivory. A lot of these like standard um, Americans with their hats and what's well, not taking selfies, taking five minutes. And I don't think elephants are treated like this in the wild. I don't think they have monkeys pulling at their ears. We were all made very uncomfortable by the number of tourists present at the feeding ceremony. Um, but I think it took us a while to realize the necessity of it because half of the amount of money that's necessary to uh, pay for the conservation of elephants and to pay for other activities such as the mobile vet comes from the, the fees paid every day by these tourists. Uh, a win-win situation in which both the wildlife there is conserved on the one hand um, from the money that is being made with tourism and on the other hand the people working there uh, are making a livelihood. They have the whole family Okay, another attempt at a conservation-based livelihood was at the Swara Plains, where Philip Tilly faced many challenges. And it was a game reserve that initially um, made their money 
and, 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 and actually um, did conservation by, by killing animals. So I made the suggestion that perhaps we should hire a professional lobbyist to go around and talk to the MPs and talk to the government officials and, and point out to them the benefits of wildlife utilisation. And I was, I was told I was crazy, that's not the way we do things, they said. So this sounds quite counterintuitive, but it actually makes sense when you sustainably um, shoot your, your animals and sell them for their meat. Um, you make money to actually maintain the larger population. However, he then had to adapt and diversify because of bans that were placed on hunting wildlife and also on urbanization pressures that were placed from the expanding the expansion of Nairobi. So we could really see how a park like that um, really use um, diversification as a surviving strategy by inviting tourists, by inviting students, by inviting um, the Maasai to graze in their lands. Another way of diversifying was uh, renting out some land to uh, third parties. This includes a permaculture farm uh, run by Gay Cullen. And basically it's what your grandmothers did. It's nothing different from that. Your great grandmothers, your grandmothers did this. <laughs> That's all we do. So it's organic farming but it's living totally off the grid. I've lived off the grid for 18 years. Such an inspiring woman could make use of the very limited resources that she had, uh, which was a very rocky and dry soil, to still uh, create a completely self-contained permaculture farm. You can also use it like marijuana. <laughs> Do you? This here is a bear <laughs> So I think she has a very distinct mindset um, how the future should look like and that is permaculture and no other way possible. Your main argument was that um, even on this dry piece of land it was still possible uh, to do agriculture. To learn more we moved to Elangatawas where the Maasai have been struggling with a drought. What are you doing? Okay. Hammering in the tracks. <laughs> How's that going for you? Very slowly. I'm waiting until I hit my fingers. We had plenty of opportunity to explore this dry land. It has recently undergone change from communal to privately owned land so that people really depended on their own private plot right now. And not every piece of land is a good piece of land to see how this relates to the pastoralist livelihoods. We conducted a trial run of a transact block study that will later be carried out by the local community. We are comparing the two parcels or the two uh, quadrats. Our experience with the transact block was quite a special one because as soon as we came there and we wanted to do the research, um, all these kids gathered around. This one is <laughs> So we're, we're drawing the plants so we can see how much there are. And within no time we were teaching them how to uh, draw out the transect and identify the different kind of plants. Which actually resulted in them doing our research. The kids helped us and we had uh, loads of fun. <laughs> it became obvious that the land was becoming degraded and that this was making an exclusively pastoral livelihood impossible, which is also already being shown by the increasing diversification in the area. And these alternatives are, are found and are all centered in mile 46. This is a market, a commercial area where, where everyone gathered and sold their stuff and sold their services um, in order to gain some money through that. We are in mile 46, a place in Loidok Lani. People come to meet people, saying hi, families meet each other. 
we were looking at Edmar 46 at the market for, for Ashuka to take home and without even thinking about the research question we bumped into this lady who was selling some vegetables and we, we got talking. The climate change was community change. And she actually told us that she, she quit her job as a teacher in order to um, in order to start farming and to show people what farming can do um, and how farming can actually provide a stable livelihood. And do you think you've been successful this far? Yeah. yeah? So much right now to prepare their land with the rain. Yeah. The main way in which she was trying to convince people is by sitting there on the market every Saturday um, and showing people that she can make money out of agriculture. I'm from this community and you can see I'm selling like I'm a master. Um, a lady like that was so passionate about her people and her practice that she dedicated the rest of her life to that. Well, you need to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're taking your business away now. So. <laughs> yeah. so sorry. Yeah. Uh, no problem. Yeah. No problem. Wow. You have to change. Yeah. Uh. You have to change. What do you need? We we talked to this Maasai lady at a market, but to actually get into the lives of these people and really try to understand. Uh, what they're dealing with every day, we did the homestay. I think one of the highlights of the program are the homestays that we're able to set up for the students. The idea of the homestay was for us to become part of the family that we joined, um, so we are not treated as guests, uh, we're not supposed to be treated as guests, but we really joined them um, as their children, um, which meant that we participated in all of their everyday activities just as if we were part of the family. We slept in their houses, which was just so welcoming, and and those people were really hospitable um, to just welcome strangers. Actually, we are. They're not easy, um, particularly the one in Maasai lands. Um, uh, definitely, it takes students out of their comfort zone. So it's really great to see them brave these new experiences. Yeah, 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 yeah. Really devastating to see how uh, little water there was available and how people had to rely every day that the water would, would fill up. Um, the Maasai moms don't really trust you with the basic things. So we could cut some vegetables, but at the end it was taken from us and it was been done again. And we could roll our chapati, but the other 30 were done by our mom. So that's what are the children saying? Mutsungu kuche. What is Mutsungu kuche mean? White guy come. White kids come. They want, they want us to come play with them. They don't understand the game. Yeah. Mutsungu kuche. Mutsungu kuche. Mutsungu kuche. Mutsungu kuche. And they all loved it because we were so different. So we just arrived at this dam and uh, people used to get their water here but as you can see uh, not much of it left. Like I did not expect the draw to be this, um, this heavy. 
fish found elephant poop. Look how big it is. Like it's it's such a strong tree, you can't do a thing with it. Uh, but if, for an elephant, it's like a toothpick. You start to understand why people don't want elephants on their land just because they're so destructive. After the homestay, we went back to our camp. Anna Mari, can you explain what's going on? Apparently, there were uh, bed bugs in our uh, mosquito nets, so now we have to be clean. <laughs> Sharing our experiences when we returned to the homestay was for me very important because we might tend to think that the way that we had experienced uh, Maasai life was the only one and in discussion with other people you do really realize that there is a huge diversity among even neighbors. And it was really fun to see that, that everyone experienced something else and that we could even learn from listening to the stories of others. And then we also got to see our youth guides perform a traditional Maasai dance and after that had a goodbye party before saying goodbye to our guides. <laughs> But then our teachers did something very clever. Caroline, Thais and David uh, really liked to surprise us. So one of their surprises was bringing us to this cultural village. Which is basically the most touristy representation of the Maasai culture. Our students were terrible guests. We were all to participate in their singing and dancing and we all felt super awkward and we were just shying away and probably being very rude to them. I saw students hiding, ducking under, under bombas. I saw others moving back. It was super fun to see how awkward we were as students and how we were just shying away from the Maasai trying really hard to impress us with their dancing. Well, those people were actually just doing their work. And I think a big problem is that we came in with a preconception about what the Maasai livelihood should be like and what was an authentic experience from just having done the homestays. The culture of Moniata is a super modern way of making a livelihood, right? It's selling your culture. This is something that, that happens all around the world. Which um, I think is a very valid way of um, generating an income, especially when drought and the traditional way of life is under threat. Giving these tours to foreigners is another way to diversify their livelihoods and adapt to changes that are happening around them. This felt quite artificial and genuine and sort of misplaced and performed and that made them feel really uncomfortable. As the cultural village was located within Ambaseli National Park, we couldn't miss the opportunity to go on a safari. And we drove around in our truck and there were baby elephants, there were hippos, baby hippos, we saw beautiful birds and at the end when we drove back home we, uh, we also passed by a, a, a herd of lions um, under the setting sun with the Kilimanjaro after us. It was just like a beautiful moment that I will never forget. Today we're going to cross the border into Tanzania. As soon as we crossed the border, it immediately became evident to us how humid, lush and green the environment was here in Tanzania. We literally moved from dry to almost tropical within a few hours. 
um, everything moves from completely exclusively pastoral to almost exclusively agricultural. There were also many, many settlements and we could already see people using pesticides and you could see that, that the population still had a huge pressure on the land. And you really saw that these, the, the people living there had a very different set of choices to make when it comes to their livelihood strategies. To see how this different environment affected the livelihoods of the Tanzanian people, we went on a second homestay. But population pressures also meant that people had to diversify, for example by starting their own businesses. And we noticed that a lot of the young people, instead of preparing to become farmers, actually try to diversify even further by going um, into higher education. When Mart and I spoke to this uh, motor taxi driver and he told us he studied geography, he had his bachelor's, but he couldn't have a job. So he had to drive his motor taxi. Um, and the thing he told us was, um, the furthest stick can never kill a snake, which means a solution from far can never solve a problem that's, that's here at our place. So our goal here was not to, to find solutions or to, to, to make the lives of these people better, but more to understand what situations these people were in. So we saw that the environment sets constraints on people's livelihoods, governance sets rules for people's livelihoods, and finally culture interacts with them and has a very complicated relationship. What has struck me the most about uh, my two weeks here is the resilience and the creativity that people have showed in trying to make um, their lives work for themselves. For me, fieldwork was one of the most rewarding experiences of my academic career, and, the, and this course is really a, a for, sort of first introduction uh, for the students to, to sort of taste this. I hope for the students, I'm certain for the students that personally this has been important to them, um, and perhaps professionally as well, that's to be determined. One of the things that was really nice for me to be part of this team is the fun part of it, and we did a lot of, uh, apart from serious stuff, we did a lot of fun and making stories during the campfire at night and up to playing football in the community. I'm uh, very happy that this program took place because it gave opportunity to uh, different uh, students uh, from uh, LUC to come and uh, get uh, different experiences from East Africa, from uh, different communities to learn about different livelihoods and I think they've uh, learned a lot and they'll be able to, uh, it will be able to influence their lives in the future. To come here, study the problems and to kill the snake here. Stay hydrated. Yeah. For boys, you, it is advisable to hold your wiener down. <laughs> Otherwise, it goes straight into your underwear. The first things we did. Uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>